Stephen, welcome to the show, brother. I've heard you say there are no bad foods, only bad preparation methods. Talk to me about that, because I thought that was a really interesting statement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So every food that you like, even no matter how much of a junk food you think it is, there is something real. You know, maybe it's hidden, maybe it's behind the scenes, maybe it's covered up with dust and carcinogenic chemicals, but there's something real underneath there. And all you have to do is sort of chisel away at all the fake crap and you'll be left with the real thing underneath, which is usually way more delicious, always way healthier, and also most of the time way more harder to make or way more hard to make, which is why we don't do it, right? That's why we have so much fake food in the first place. Uh, but if you think about here's one way to to get at this if you think about all the fake processed foods that you know all the artificial flavors none of them are completely invented right vanillin is a common uh artificial flavor it comes from it's a petroleum derived like synthetic chemical but it tastes like vanilla nutritional yeast or yeast extract is it might sound healthy but it's actually just msg containing powder that companies who sell vegan products that want them to make them taste like cheese add to make it taste like cheese even mm -hmm. though there's no dairy um so it tastes like cheese and just go down the list every single artificial flavor is trying to mimic something real mm -hmm. and i think that that tells us something about what humans actually want to eat um even in the fake food world we live in everything is just pretending to be real. So what I say is stop pretending to be real, just be real, right? Instead of having vanillin, have freaking vanilla. Instead of having nutritional yeast or yeast extract, have cheese powder, like the actual cheese like from the actual food. Since all the flavors that you like anyway in your Doritos or whatever else are simply like mimicking real things, stop mimicking and just have the real thing. Um, and that's, I guess, how you can think of the fact that like, there are no such things as fake flavors that we like. Um, and then, you know, it's not just artificial flavors that are the problem, of course, all the other ingredients, but you can address every single problem with, you know, the ingredients in your food and in turn, and then turn something delicious, junky, but fake into something delicious and real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think about the humble French fry is a good example, right? Oh, um, yeah a crappy potato fried in some seed oils and put on a table some to, with some crappy microplastic laden salt is very different yeah. to an organic potato that you get and you cook at home, maybe yeah. even soak it in some water to pull out the starch and then you fry it in some tallow and you put on some microplastic free, you know, flaky sea salt. Like that's a completely different food, but on paper it kind of yeah. looks like the same food. Yeah, it looks the same and it has the same name and therefore people think everything, it's it's all the same. So humans are like word-based creatures. We think in ideas or we think in words rather. And if a concept has a word associated with it, then your brain naturally assumes that all of those things that have that word associated with it are the same thing. Mm. So if you use the word milk, for example, this milk is the same as that milk, which is the same as every other milk. However, what, you know, they might've all been, uh, come from different species of cow. They might have all come from cows that eat different foods, whether different, even different types of grass or different corn or different soy or whatever. Some cows might have eaten a ton of pesticides. Some might have been given hormones. Some might have lived in a warehouse. Some might be on a regenerative farm out in Wyoming or something. Some milk might be in a glass bottle. Some milk might be in plastic. Some milk might be t uh, pasteurized. Some milk might be ultra high temperature pasteurized. And yet it's all called milk. Mm. And so people have this like they put all the milk in the bucket and if they if they figure out that say let's say they are told milk is bad for them well what's it's not really that milk is bad for you right maybe it's this type of milk or like this kind of milk or milk prepared in this way but because we don't have the words to describe all these different variations we automatically assume that you know it's the the bad quality is applied to every version of milk and so all of a sudden you know people who are going dairy free <laughs> Because store bought ultra high temperature pasteurized warehouse milk has you know made them uh, gave them acne, and now they're going milk free, even though raw pasteurized regenerative farm milk in a glass bottle from their local farmer would never have caused the same reaction. And so this is like really insidious, and it's like very counterproductive because people are unable to distinguish the good things from the bad things. 
uh, it requires a very sort of nuanced appreciation for this. And, and there are certain you know examples like sommeliers and wine, right? They're trained on knowing the different varieties of grape from the different in the different regions in France and Italy and different lengths of fermentation and even what barrels the wine is aged and they can taste all these things. But if you ask like any average person who's not an expert in wine to tell you the differences in, you know, four different wines, they won't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so as like health people, we we kind of we must become connoisseurs of food in a sense. <clears throat> we must learn to appreciate what makes good beef good beef or what makes good milk good milk or what makes good cheese good cheese or what makes good snacks or like good chips good chips we have to figure this out and develop a sort of refined taste and a refined palate for all the different factors that go into them yeah it's a really interesting point and what's funny in your analogy there of drinking the kind of crappy pasteurized milk is that someone will, will then say, okay, I'm going to go dairy free and then I'm going to transition to a nut milk. And the right. limbic hijacking that has gone on here to convince you that that is milk, because I guess almond juice wouldn't have the same ring to it. But again, quite clearly, it's a very, that's an ultra processed food too. And the sourcing right. of the milk in the first place was really the issue. So I guess as we become these connoisseurs of what this food is, uh, one of the places to probably stop and ask is how's that, how, the, how, how does that make my body feel? How is this the closest thing to what nature creates in this kind of divine, mm -hmm. delicious food that nourishes us. And I know that that's what is part of the story of Massa and developing products that actually answer that question. But where did this all begin for you? How did you even come to think about this? Because this wasn't always your path, right? No. Well, so about 10 years ago, I was just finishing up my freshman year in college. And that was the first time in my life that I had ever eaten significant amounts of food that my mother had not cooked. <laughs> Um, I, my mom is the child of Italian immigrants and she dutifully cooked everything that I ever ate my entire life. Um, her grandfather or her father was like a food snob as well as most Italians coming to America are. They would, you know, back in the seventies or eighties, whenever they would go on road trips as a family, he would, instead of stopping at the restaurants on the side of the highway, they would pack a freezer full of steaks. And he would have his Weber charcoal grill in the car driving down to Florida. What a guy. And he would pull over and like light the charcoal grill in a parking lot. And they would have steaks like on the road to Florida because they couldn't, they would not, he would not let them eat at some crappy American restaurant. So I grew up with food of that sort. Uh, never a, a super in depth knowledge on all of the health things that, you know, we all on, on social media now know today. But always like a sort of emphasis on quality and like taste, right? Oh, we would never eat jarred tomato sauce. Like, no, we make our own sauce, like this kind of thing. It, it, it's less so about health and more about, I guess you could say, culinary snobbishness is, <laughs> is probably one way to put it. Um, but so that was how it were, were, that was the world I grew up in. And then when I went to college and I had this dining hall that, you know, was like a 24 7 fast food restaurant. And even though the dining hall at like my school was considered better than probably many others. I started developing all sorts of health problems hmm. and got really sick by the end of the year. And in my quest to sort of figure out what was wrong with me and get back to normal health again, I ended up stumbling into the whole health, food, nutrition, fitness rabbit hole. Um, and that was that was probably around 10 years ago. And then it's just been developing ever since. Hmm. It's so interesting too how your self-proclaimed probable food snobbery led you away from some of the biggest offenders here because proud Italians are going to use a good quality olive oil. They're not going to go for some cheap, nasty canola right. oil. And this right. is now you go to college and everything's there and it's, you know, it's kind of just go ham and have a party and you're probably getting your first exposure to massive boluses of seed oil. So is this really, yeah. even though you probably didn't know it then, would you say that this was the start of the catalyst for eventually what has become Massa Chippy seed oil? Food yeah, yeah, oil? absolutely. Because, because that like sort of knowledge initially and, and fixing myself, I think I did the paleo diet for the first three months of, you know, this, this little project, I ended up feeling like I could breathe through my nose for the first time in my life. That mm. was one of the additional, uh, sort of benefits I, I dealt when I started getting healthy, I could breathe through my nose. I wasn't getting sick all the time. My digestive stress was a lot more, mm -hmm. was much uh, more minimized. And after a few months of this, I was just super convinced at the power of food to affect everything about us, right? The whole cliche, you are what you eat is 100% true. And like in the sense that every molecule that makes up your body and brain, of course, came from something you ate. You know, you have water molecules in you and they're going to get flushed out eventually. Mm -hmm. You have 
say, uh, like you, you breathe in air, but like that's not the air you breathe doesn't turn into your body. That's not true with plants. Trees, for example, breathe in carbon dioxide and that turns into wood, right? They they become what they breathe. People become what they eat 100%, mm -hmm. 100% of our cells. And so that's so super true. And it's like, do you, did I want to eat? Do you want to eat? Or do you want to be like a Walmart processed, packaged, artificial flavored thing? Like why you don't want to be that. You're a, you're a human being. Why would you want to be that? Mm -hmm. And so... You know, I, I learned more and more about all this stuff. I, I started fermenting foods at one point. I was brewing kombucha in my college dorm room and like freaking people out when they saw the scoby in a jar against the wall. I began making sourdough bread at one point as well. This was like way before COVID ever occurred. Um, and I would have a, I had a grain mill in my kitchen and I would like mill einkorn and like make sourdough bread in my little tiny oven in the studio apartment that I lived in. Um, I did the carnivore diet for at some point for a few months. Uh, all of these, I even and before that, I was like sprouting broccoli seeds, mm -hmm. and, like and sprouting quinoa and all this, like all of these things. Um, and so that was definitely my primary intellectual curiosity, passion over the time frame, if you will. And it was that sort of knowledge that led me to creating my social media accounts, and then that was the spot from which I, I was able to launch Masa. Mm. Talk to me about the social media accounts and then we'll come back to Massa because your handle yeah. is the really tan man. And I want to hear the right. story about that. And then I want to get into the story about seed oils, right. a bit of the history and how they can actually really mess up our endeavors to be really tan men. So t take us on a journey <laughs> there. Nice. Sure. Yeah. So I had a bunch of false starts on my social media journey over the years. You know, like I said, this, this occurred around 10 years ago and, and I would say maybe seven years ago i started to know enough that i could feel confident like talking about it publicly but i can never think of a good name and i think that's like a a pretty decent you know signal or metaphor for when you you think you should start something right if you don't have a good name for it even if you have a good idea even if you have all the positions in place it's like something about like the universe is telling you it's not ready to happen yet and so I never had, I never could never come up with a good name. I had, I had a few, tried a few things. Eaten with Steven was one of the earlier nice. embarrassing <laughs> attempts. Um, there are a few others that we don't need to get into, but I never, I was never able to figure it out until I was talking to a friend of mine who had just started making TikTok videos. This was in 2021. And he was telling me about how many views he was getting on TikTok, all this stuff. Like uh, he was blowing up viral, virality was right around the corner within reach for anyone with a with a cell phone camera or an iPhone camera. And so we were brainstorming what ideas I could use for a name. And at this point, I was living in South Florida for probably two years. And I was just super, super tan. And I was tanning every single day. Of course, I hadn't been eating seed oils for many years at this point. Um, I was tanning every single day. Uh, naturally, I'm a little bit more uh, olive skinned if you will because mm -hmm. of the southern italian heritage however you know it was it was definitely different than I, than I am today i was i was out there every single day so somehow my friend just like blurted out like tan like you know things that rhyme with man i don't know tan man i like you know my ears kind of perked up and i was like oh that's a cool idea really tan man was available so i took it and then i started making tiktoks about all the stuff that i cared about I think seed oils were one of the hot button topics at the time. This is in 2021. And I remember getting into like these sort of TikTok video stitching fights mm -hmm. with this one account who kept just defending seed oils. Mm -hmm. And in her bio, she's like a food chemist. Mm. And it's like, dude, you, you understand, like people watching this, like you understand that her employer is a food company that asks her to do chemical engineering to create fake flavors. And that's not even me being uncharitable. That's literally her job, right? And her title and her bio was just like, this is this is so ridiculous. Why why is this even why are people even getting credence to this? But it's true. People believe and people listen to people like that. So that kind of kind of motivated me to keep talking about all this stuff. And eventually I, I added an Instagram to the portfolio. A few months later I started Twitter. And that was around the time when the idea for Masa also came about. Hmm. 
Now, you mentioned something there that I think you and I both understand. You are the really tan man. I am on a quest to become one of the most tan ginger men in the world, mm-hmm. and I'm, 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 I'm going for it. But one of the key philosophies in that is to avoid seed oils. But some people might not know why we're saying that and what, sure. what this even means. Take us on a little bit of a yeah. journey. Like, What's the history of seed oils? And then why is tanning so difficult with seed oils? Why do they promote sun oxidation, sun sure. burning, a.k.a.? The whole history of seed oil as well. See how how fast I can do this. Uh, So seed oils are only made possible at scale by the invention of industrial equipment that can be used to extract them. And thus humanity never ate seed oils in significant quantities until the early 1900s. Mm. So they are a completely novel concept, novel, a completely novel addition to the American diet and in particular they represent 20% of the calories that Americans consume. So not only are they brand new, which is, you know, if you understand health, ancestral health, whatever it is, you understand that we evolved to eat certain things and not to eat other things. People Mm -hmm. debate about what we evolved to eat and what we didn't, but that's the point, right? Eat what you evolved to eat. No one evolved to eat seed oils because they didn't exist. How could you have? So not only do we have this new thing, it's also being consumed in quantities unlike any other ingredient right? Yes, people, we have pesticides in the food. Yes, we have this artificial flavor. Yes, we have red number 40 or whatever. But if you look at the quantities, all of those things are very minuscule. Um, even sugar, right? A lot of foods have sugar, but we've been eating sugar in other formats for many, many years. Mm-hmm. I'm not, and, and certainly there's a difference, but seed oils are a completely new thing, mm-hmm. new entry to the human, di- new entrant into the human diet and by far the most significant. And one of the things that they do is they decompose or oxidize in the presence of heat, light, and oxygen. Um, part of <clears throat> the the reason for this is due to where they're found. Seed oils are typically found in the seeds of plants that are designed to grow in colder climates. Canola, rapeseed is the name of the plant for canola oil. Peanut oil um, is high in PUFAs, but it's not actually that high in PUFAs. And PUFA, by the way, is the type of fat that's mm-hmm. in seed oils. Um, sunflower seed oil, safflower seed oil, right? Like Ukraine, which has winters, you know, is the global ex like the single biggest exporter of sunflower seed oil, I believe, hmm. or at least in Europe. Canada, where which is cold, is where all the canola oil comes from. Like the name canola oil actually was like invented by this Canadian government backed group to like rebrand rapeseed oil because no one wants to eat rapeseed oil. Yeah, that's so they a named marketing it can- problem. <laughs> yeah, so they named it canola, like literally Canada Ola, Canada hmm. oil. Because Ola is like oil in some, I don't know, whatever language, I forget what. So seed oils, because they come from seeds that are grown in you know places with winter, um, the seeds of those plants must like germinate and sprout and they can't freeze. So this is kind of the, the function of, of polyunsaturated fats in many instances in nature. Polyunsaturated fats are kind of like nature's antifreeze. If you ever put a bottle of olive oil in the fridge, you'll know that it solidifies. If you ever put a you know, tallow out at room temperature, you know that it solidifies. But polyunsaturated fats remain liquid even at refrigerated temperatures. Mm-hmm. This is also why cold water fish have high degrees of polyunsaturated fats. Because if salmon who are swimming up in Alaska were filled with tallow, they would get frozen into a block the mm-hmm. minute they went into the water. They wouldn't be able to like wiggle, wiggle their tails around. They couldn't move. So there's this like f- fundamental like place and role in nature for polyunsaturated fats. And it is in basically cold-blooded organisms that live in cold climates. And humans might live in cold climates, but we are certainly not cold-blooded organisms. Mm-hmm. So when you eat seed oils, the, the natural, you know, because people talk about, oh, they're oxidized seed oils, like the manufacturing process heats them up um, and and makes them rancid or whatever. It doesn't even matter what the manufacturing process does. Once you eat them and they're swimming around in your 98.6 degree oxygen rich body, <laughs> your blood is full of oxygen, your body is full of oxygen, they're going to oxidize regardless. And that oxidation, of course, as we know, is heat sensitive, uh, is accelerated by the presence of of additional heat, namely from the sun in your skin when you're tanning. Hmm. So if you have these oils in your skin, which everyone does if you eat them, because they turn into cell membranes, they turn into subcutaneous fat, right? Like that's the point of fat in your diet is to build your body in this way and the skin is part of your body. 
So if you have seed oils in your diet and therefore in your skin, when your skin is exposed to the sun, that oxidation reaction happens quicker. And that inflammation that's caused by the breakdown of the seed oils happens more quickly. Mm. And that inflammation that people see often is what's called sunburn. Yeah, and I can attest to that anecdotally speaking as a ginger kid growing up, we used to spend our summers in Spain and I would have to have kind of a mm -hmm. first uh, day of the summer, just terrible sunburn, blisters on the shoulders, yeah. just kind of had to get it out of the way and it sucked. And I could not avoid that for the life of me, but I was raised on yeah. a completely junky diet. All the seed yeah. oils, all the nonsense, mm -hmm. all the artificial, this, that, and the other, gloom containing grains, you name it, all the stuff. And um, since, you know, coming more, going down the same kind of meat pill as you did and carnivore now coming back to more of like an animal based eat real food diet that that is so hard for me to do now i would have to go out of my way to try and get a sunburn my body's so resilient because there's essentially no linoleic acid in my diet tiny bits that come through food but pr pretty yeah. much it's all saturated fats from meat and eggs and you named it but you said that our bodies are built on these it's we we become what we eat is it possible in your opinion to detox from seed oils yeah, absolutely. I mean, your everyone knows the the sort of middle school stat that like every cell in your body is refreshed every at least uh, seven years at least. Um, so yeah, I, there's one piece of like actual research that looked into the sort of half life of PUFAs in the body, and that that research pointed it to be two years. Mm -hmm. So in two years, half the seed oils that are in your body today will be gone. Uh, if they're, you know, the ones that are stored in your tissues. And then two years from then, half of the ones that are there will be gone. So it takes about seven or eight, seven, eight, seven years to get to like 90% reduction from today if you stop immediately. Mm. And that's, of course, according to this one study that wasn't even, I think this was an accidental result of the study where he was looking into something else entirely, but like figured out that, hey, this is cool and worth mentioning. Um, however, that was not done in a in a setting where people were trying to actually detoxify seed oils from their body actively there are many things that you can do to help accelerate that process none of which have actually a ton of research on them because mm -hmm. no one has ever researched this <laughs> it's not really something that the nih has ever uh thought would be an interesting thing to know mm -hmm. uh for, for reasons that might be obvious to some people however they uh yeah so if you were to add in those like detoxification protocols if you will i would suspect that you could reduce the activity of seed oils in your body much more quickly and again anecdotally speaking i know so many people who are like i quit seed oils for three months and then i was able to tan mm -hmm. so i don't think it takes very long i'm sure it takes a while to get all of them out but i don't think it takes very long to get enough of it out um i will say though even if you do fully detox your body from seed oils, obviously it's possible for you to get sunburn. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not saying like seed oils are the root cause of sunburn. I'm saying they enable and accelerate sunburn, which could and and do, obviously does happen um, by via, via other means, right? The skin can only tolerate so much sunlight, mm -hmm. just like you can put your finger in front of a flame quickly and it won't burn. But if you hold your finger in front of the fire, I don't care what your diet looks like, your finger's gonna yep. burn. Um, and that's and that's certainly true So uh, of sunburn. So whenever it's the summer, you know, I know it's winter right now, people might go on holidays and somewhere warm or in a few months, you're gonna be getting out there. Don't just show up to Fort Lauderdale for spring break <laughs> in three months and then like go from your cubicle fluorescent light, like sweater weather life for the past five months and then spend eight hours in the sun. I don't care what you eat, you're going to burn. Or even how dark you are. You, like <laughs> It's not good for you, right? Yeah. Just like anything else, you must build up a tolerance to it. It just happens to be the case that the seed oil content of our skin accelerates and enables the sunburn, uh, which certainly would naturally occur given enough dosage. Um, and then the other thing too, if you, if you naturally avoid seed oils, you're going to be eating more vitamin uh, or you're going to be eating more cholesterol-rich foods. Mm -hmm. And the other cool thing here is that UV light on your skin reacts with cholesterol to produce vitamin D. So if your body is starved of cholesterol, you could imagine how that reaction is unable to be completed. And so the UV has nowhere to go other than like kind of, you know, hitting into your skin cells. So I think those two things for tanning specifically are the most important. Eat cholesterol and don't eat seed oils.
Well said, brother, and quite a controversial statement there as a uh, juxtaposed to our public health experts who would say, eat no cholesterol and only guzzle seed oils, but uh, we're, yeah. on, we're on team cholesterol over here. And, I and think that's right. why they love sunscreen so uh, much. They can't go outside and they post TikTok videos. They're like, why put, why you need to put sunscreen on even if you don't leave the house, mm. you know? Have you ever went there's, down the rabbit hole? More of like an esoteric, like metaphorical understanding of sunscreen and seed oils that you might apply, which is that the sun is was you know we literally worshipped by many cultures throughout history and yes. is at least metaphorically regarded it can be regarded as the source of all material mm -hmm. like in the material sense it is the the source of material life in the universe um it is considered you know divine in in many ways and the people who eat seed oils and the associated lifestyle that goes along with them like what it does to them is it literally makes them unable to meet the source, like it, it, the source of life face to face. It's like kind of demonic, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about it, because it's like a withdrawal from the source of life. Um, it's a withdrawal from divine energies, if you will. So yeah, that's what you're doing when you're sitting in your little office with your sunscreen and cowering behind your fluorescent light bulbs. Um, it's no wonder why these people also have so many other problems. Yeah, no doubt, man. Not only are you disconnecting yourself from source energy and just, man, anybody, go lay out in the sun for 20 minutes at the appropriate dose and tell me you don't feel better, right? There's nothing that won't be made better by that. But not only are you removing that and that energy, that chi, that prana, whatever you want to call it, but now you're la layering on top this toxic sunscreen, which has these known carcinogenic compounds that will oxidize in the sun as well and oxidize on top of the oxidized linoleic acid in your skin. And you have a pretty good recipe there for the big C, which the experts would tell you is caused by the sun. Maybe it's more so caused by the cancer-causing chemicals that you you put in and on your skin and the diet outside of it etc yeah like oh that's a great idea let's try to defend ourselves against sunscreen by putting literal carcinogens in our skin <laughs> like that i just it's just like so hilariously ironic that that is the headline i'm reading you know what was that a year and a half ago when when they were talking about how johnson johnson or whoever it was had actual carcinogens in the sunscreen mm -hmm. and of course those are the ones that are known to be carcinogens what about all the other chemicals that are not known or not yet known to be carcinogens yes exactly exactly so you're learning all of this and you, like you said you you kind of was more so just sharing about this uh, it was really interesting to you you had some uh, stories that you wanted to tell but then this kind of coalesced and birthed massa the the chip project that you've been working on and building now this beautiful bag that i have sitting in front of me here this delicious tasty treat so what's the story there tell me about that Sure. So when I was posting my TikTok videos, one of the things that I noticed was that people would kind of say, okay, cool, well and good. I understand this. I should eat this and not that. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, eat natural foods. We get it. But I don't have the time to actually go and do that. And, you know, for context, at this time, I was like working as a software engineer and it was like remote work and I did not work very many hours per day. And so I did have a lot of time to drive around farmer's markets, drive around Whole Foods, drive here, drive there, cook my food, whatever. And so I would post my recipes, I would post what I'm eating, and then people were just like, this is so impractical. Like, I can't actually do this. And that got me thinking pretty early on how if we were to go, if we're going to fix like the health of people, if we're going to actually solve the problem, the answer is not going to be in more TikToks and more content, right? The answer is going to be in actually enabling people to apply that advice. There's so many people who talk about, you know, what to eat, what not to eat, whatever. That is, I'm not going to say completely commoditized, but that information is available. If you want to figure out how to be healthy, you can figure out how to be healthy. Mm -hmm. What's not so easy is actually going and doing the things required to be healthy. And so if you think about another way of thinking about this is in the 1950s or whenever, whenever people were still skinny. <laughs> Did they have Weight Watchers? Did they do CrossFit five times a week? Mm -hmm. Did what's his face in Mad Men, um, the the guy in the in the show? Did he like wake up at four a.m. and like sun his balls, go to a cold plunge, get some red light therapy, and <clears throat> and then do like two hours of functional training before putting on a suit and going to work? Hell no, of course not. Did he go to the special grocery store with the special healthy food, like Whole Foods or whatever? No. Did he cook everything he ever ate? No. And yet, people like him, entire the entire generation, 
of people almost so from then until the dawn of time have been largely fit and healthy so why is it that we who try so hard to be healthy and fit we go to the gym so much we have weight watchers we have coke zero we have diet coke we have artificial sweeteners we have aspartame and allulose and stevia and xylitol we have calorie counting apps we have an entire category an entire category in every food store dedicated to quote unquote healthy food we have low fat foods we have like marathons and 10 different types of gyms in a single small town that you could join how is it that we who have all this stuff are still fat and getting fatter it's not as if you know people especially people in our in our space uh like to think that you know because they're getting healthier everyone else around them is getting healthier mm -hmm. and maybe that's what they see on the internet on, on instagram or whatnot like that might be true but what's not true is that everyone is getting healthier it, it's the act it's the opposite like mm -hmm. even when i was a kid which i don't consider myself that old but when i was a kid people were way more fit just like the average person when i was a freshman in college there was like almost no one who was overweight and by the time i was a senior there were way more people who were overweight probably about a third of people maybe even half um so why is it that we try so damn hard you know and we don't have any results everyone's overweight everyone's sick it's getting worse by the by the day it's not again for lack of information if you want the information it's out there it's a lack of ability to actually implement that information which is the problem and so i realized that very early on and i'm like well if i'm going to fix this problem i have to go make it easier for people to do this obviously it's a tall order uh nothing short of like creating basically an entirely different world mm. which resembles in many ways uh the world of prior to the kind of the the green revolution and like the chemical exposure that started in i would argue the late 60s um short of doing that and getting in a time machine we have to actually enable people to be healthy without having to try very hard you know again if you're that person in the 50s you go to the diner you eat the food you go home you you know maybe you stop at the grocery store on the way you pick up the milk at the milk store or the, the milkman drops milk off on your front yard or your front porch um you don't have to try the mm -hmm. things just show up and they're healthy they're just good right they also don't taste bad that's another problem with the whole health foods today most of the health foods taste bad mm. go to the health food store go to the health food aisle vegan chia seeds like cassava kale whatever it's not good right you don't want to eat this you think um you think Marilyn Monroe was like eating kale chia pudding and like green juice hell no she was eating like ribeyes and raw carrots mm -hmm. literally that was her diet um she's maybe a special example but no she was not <laughs> she was not eating chia pudding and kale smoothies so um so that was kind of the problem I was trying to solve and I didn't really know how I was going to go about doing it but it turned out that I had my perfect case study in a friend of mine when we were in uh, in Florida, uh, in Miami, on a New Year's trip uh, a few months later. This was because it's it's January now, so this is almost exactly two years ago, or this was a little bit more than two years ago. They, uh, my friend, was eating I don't know Tostitos or some crap. Then I come downstairs early in the morning on January first, and I just like look at this, and I'm like. A friend of mine the tan man eating <laughs> seed oils like it right in my in my house because it was i had i had gotten a house when i was in fort lauderdale um living there to escape covid but that's a whole other story in my own house someone eating tostitos and so i start like ranting at him about why they're so bad why you shouldn't be doing this this and that and he gave me the response uh he, he brought up two points that are, are pretty common anyone who's southeast probably ever heard one of which is I'd rather enjoy my life than be healthy. Mm. Classic. And the other is even if I could figure out how to like go eat healthy food, I don't have the time. And unlike me, he was working in finance and working a hundred hours a week. So he didn't have the time. That's true. So I'm like, dude, you don't understand. You don't have to eat gross things in order to be healthy. I developed my whole food philosophy about, you know, there's no such thing as bad foods, only uh, bad ingredients by then. I'm like, you don't have to give up anything that you like in fact you can have even better food 
the food I eat on a daily basis is delicious. Grass-fed butter and raw milk and honey and sourdough bread and um, like grilled ribeyes and whatever, you know, fresh or- organic oranges, like delicious, you mm-hmm. know? So I started to explain this to him. I'm like, you know, the same thing is possible with tortilla chips, like the ones that you're eating. You could have a tortilla chip that is healthy enough for me, but is also even more delicious than this crappy ass tostitos that you're eating. Like 30 cents an ounce. Like, how do you make food? How do you make, mm-hmm. how do you take corn and turn it into chips and send it all the way around the country, sell it and get it into your mouth for 30 cents an ounce? It's insane. Yeah, that's wild. So I start describing anyway, I start describing how this chip might, like might, what might, might characterize this chip. And he's like, oh, cool. That sounds good. Well, like, where can I get them? I'm like, oh, well, here's the cr- here's the kicker. You can't, you've got to make them. Mm. It's like, well, I don't have the time for that. Like, why don't you go make them? And so he basically challenged me to go make them. And I'm like, okay, fair point, touche. Maybe I should go make them. And then I did. A few months later, I, I, we had gone home you know, after the New Year's trip. We went our separate ways. And I made the first prototype of moss in my parents' backyard on the deck in a turkey fryer with a box of grass-fed tallow um, and some organic corn tortillas that I'd found. And I made the prototype. They, you know, were honestly shockingly good, even for me. Mm. I wasn't expecting that much. I was expecting them to be kind of like beefy tasting and like, eh. But they were so good. And I fed them to my extended family again, food snobs, right? Not in the health sense, but in like the taste mm-hmm. and quality sense. And they thought they were good too. And these are people who have made fun of me multiple times for eating raw liver and beef and like, you know, lamb testicles and whatever else. <laughs> so they were telling me, that this was a good chip and that's when i knew this was like super special and we had to go and, and bring it out into the world look at that man and the rest as they say is history or evolving history in your case as you continue to go from oh, strength to strength very evolving yeah. tell me about like this i it's a, i butcher this word every time what's it nixtamalization nixtamalization okay mm-hmm. what's that all about yeah. when it comes to corn yeah so as i'm sure the listeners of this show might be familiar with mm-hmm. when you have seeds they have their defense mechanisms, you know, and or plants in general, but seeds in particular have their chemical defense mechanisms and they make it uh, hard, difficult for organisms like humans to eat them. Every grain, of course, is a seed. And yet every civilization has built itself off of grains. Mm-hmm. Obviously, meat is very good for us, but it cannot be argued that grains are the thing that enabled civilization to exist. Whether or not, you know, future civilization requires them, you know, not here to mm-hmm. debate. But it is true that every civilization that has thrived has had grains as a staple in its diet. It's also true that every civilization that's had grains as a staple in its diet has developed a unique way of preparing that grain that allows it to be most easily digested mm-hmm. by the people that are eating it. So the Europeans, of course, invented or the Egyptians or the Babylonians, whatever. Western culture invented sourdough fermentation. Mm. And so they made sourdough bread, and that's why bread exists, and that's how you get Egypt and Sumeria and you know Europe. Uh, you have rice in Asia, which of course is usually soaked and then boiled. So the act of soaking it and boiling it in water is the thing that cooks it um, and you know pr- gets the anti-nutrients out of it such that it's able to be digested. And in Latin America, you have corn, which was nixtamalized. And so nixtamalization is a it is an Aztec word, I believe. And it is simply their process for making corn more digestible. Hmm. And in the case of corn, it's not sourdough fermented. It's not, um, it is boiled, but there, there's something else to it. Uh, you basically boil corn with crushed up limestone, which is a mm-hmm. rock that you can find. It's also known as calcium hydroxide. And that material reacts with the hard cellulose shell and softens it up and breaks it down. Anyone who's ever had a corn on the cob and then went to the bathroom afterwards knows that what undigested cellulose mm-hmm. from corn can do to your gut. So nixtamalization, boil is when you boil the corn with limestone and it breaks down the cellulose shell, it softens it up. Uh, you eventually rinse this off. And it does a few other things to the corn, like getting rid of mycotoxins. I think it activates some form of, uh, I think it's vitamin vitamin B1 or mm-hmm. B3, I forget which one. Um, and it makes certain other amino acids more bioavailable. But the main thing is like the cellulose um, and of course the phytic acid and other anti-nutrients. 
And then after you boil it, you, you rinse it off and then you crush it up into like a paste and you flatten that paste out into circles. And that's what a tortilla is. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Aztecs invented who knows how many thousands of years ago. And that's, uh, that's how you eat. That's how you prepare digestible corn. And that's what we do, which is not at all what many of the common tortilla chip brands do that people are familiar with. Wait, so Doritos is not doing this pro <laughs> this process? No, no, they're not. <laughs> this explains the 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 moniker of like the ancient crunch. You're really pulling in this ancestral wisdom. Yeah. So now you're left with a easily digestible, far superior, uh, nutritionally dense, and then you're frying it in a great oil, and then you're basically adding some flavorings like salt or some organic chili powder, etc. And there you have massive yes. chips. Yes, absolutely. All of the, all of the, couldn't have said it better myself. All of the spices. That's another thing too. It's like the small details matter here. Like we had a lime chip. That was our second flavor that we launched. And I thought it was going to be easy because every, you know, chip brand has a lime flavored chip. And I guess I was a little bit naive hmm. when I thought we could do it too so easily because I, what I didn't realize was what the ingredients for those lime chips actually consisted of. And there's basically three things that go into the lime flavor of 100% of lime flavored snack products that you can find. They are lime oil, citric acid, and maltodextrin. Hmm. That's, that's what you got. Maybe there's also like natural lime flavor, whoever knows, like who knows what that means. Uh, there's also artificial lime flavor. But the main things that you'll see, especially in the healthy category, are citric acid, lime oil, and maltodextrin and, and and i'm like buy, trying to find lime powder to buy so i can put on my chips i'm like what the hell where's the lime powder there is no lime powder i found again lime oil i found a bunch of citric acid <laughs> i found a bunch of maltodextrin but i did not find the powder of limes if you will to be as explicit as possible hmm. so we had to set about literally powderizing limes ourselves like buying bushels of organic limes and like turning them into powder we, when I first started this, the, the best answer we came up with was slicing and dehydrating them and then grinding it into a powder, which we are still doing. Uh, uh, but very shortly, we are going to switch to freeze dry because mm -hmm. that preserves more of the nutrients uh, in the final process. Um, but yeah, you have to turn it into powder somehow. And it's not that trivial. And that's why I suppose people, other brands that are less food snobbish than I might be, uh, will settle for all sorts of like fake flavors with something just as simple as a lime chip. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not even like a complex blend of spices. It's one flavor. Well, the like the it doesn't sound like. I guess you're inventing supply chains in some in some way, right? You're having to completely reinvent the wheel, which is probably why these other companies won't do it. Why would they? It's already set right. up in place. They don't care. They're just trying to turn a profit. It's a very cheap kind of gross food and. Right. probably the person that's eating it really doesn't care either because they're pursuing mouth pleasure whereas your consumer is different with this chip they're willing to pay a bit more of a premium price everything yeah. is pretty intentional it seems from the outside looking in the 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 kind of marketing the vibe of the instagram the packaging of the of the actual product itself i think i've heard you describe it's almost like you want it to be seen as a as a as a flex it's an item it's a designer item mm -hmm. it looks good it, it looks much better than your cool ranch doritos or whatever the heck mm -hmm. they're called so Tell me a little bit about that, the marketing, the vibe, the, yeah. the, the kind of ideal client you're looking at when you think about Masa. Sure. Yeah, so so making this product is obviously a challenge. You know, I can make it myself and or my wife can make it and we can have chips every now and again for dinner. But it's not that easy. You know, people like to say, oh, I made tortilla chips at home. And it's like, I saw the pictures on Instagram. No, you didn't. Right. <laughs> Getting Masa Harina flour and then adding, reconstituting it with a little bit of water and putting it on your pan and then like baking it in the oven. That is not a moss chip. It is like, it's okay, but it's not that good. And it's even still, it's a lot of work for what you get. So we have to actually sell this product. We have to do it well. We have to do it right. Making it at home does not cut it, right? This goes back to my whole thing about making food convenient. You have to just be able to go to the store and buy it, not go do something crazy at home in your little, you know, mad scientist kitchen lab. You have to just be able to go out and buy it. Now that poses a problem because you can't go out and buy this and there is no factory that you can go out and buy it from, hmm. even if you wanted to start it. We, that's one of the reasons why it took so long to get off the ground. We had the idea in January and we sold our first bag in July. And the reason why is because we spent four months trying to look for a factory that can make it for us. 
I called every single chip factory in the country and none of them would be interested or interested or able to make this product. Mostly because of the tallow, right? But even still the whole nixtamalization process, that's not done by mm -hmm. most chip manufacturers. Most chip manufacturers grind up the corn into flour and then add limestone into the flour and then mix it all with water into the dough. And they never actually rinse the lime out. Like they don't mm. actually boil it. They don't do the process. They don't do the thing. It's like the say you could think of it as like putting yeast in in making bread instead of sourdough that mm -hmm. takes like three like two days to ferment, whatever. It's like putting yeast in bread. It's a shortcut. It doesn't it, but it doesn't do the same thing. Just like how sourdough actually deactivates most of the gluten content um found in the bread itself, and yeast doesn't. So does nixtamalization actually do change it, the corn in like useful ways that this other cheating process doesn't. So yeah, we spent like three or four months trying to find a factory to do it for us. And then we realized that the only, like no one wanted to do it. Some guy even was like, oh, if it was coconut oil, I could do it. I'm like, dude, mm -hmm. I'm frying my corn chip in coconut oil. That's like, first of all, it would taste terrible. Second of all, frying these coconut oil actually feels greasier. I don't know if you ever tried it, but they always come out greasy. Like plantain chips that mm -hmm. you can buy, so greasy. And third of all, I'm not importing coconut oil from the Philippines, like across the Pacific Ocean, driving it all the way up to New Jersey mm. just so I can like make some tortilla chips. No, like that's so lame. Um, we need to make this with like locally available materials. That's a whole other thing. So anyway, we had to make it ourselves. That was the punchline. And making fried foods at, you know, small scale, even small scale is very labor intensive mm -hmm. from the first day of production there was me there was my dad and there were i think two or three other people one of them was a friend that i had roped into helping me and so even on the first day we had like a staff of like five people having to make these chips and put them in bags and package them and all this other stuff so that is obviously a very expensive endeavor mm -hmm. coupled with the fact that you know for example the lime powder We've been making it in house, so I don't even know how much it's costing us. But we're finally able to find someone with the right equipment and the right process to do it for us. The lime powder will cost forty dollars a pound, like for a spice mm -hmm. that we're dumping all over the chips. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the Cobanero chili itself, that chili powder, I think, is around twenty dollars a pound, and that's like the super exotic chili grown only in one region of Guatemala by these farmers that have been there for like centuries. Yeah. And even still lime powder is like more than twice the price. So it's like this whole thing is obviously very expensive. <clears throat> and so we knew for for we, we knew that we were going to have to charge and a fair amount of money for what we were making in order to be able to grow without having to, you know, either compromise on our values or sell out to someone who, you know, would compromise on our values if they were given the chance. And then also the other thing that we were thinking about is like, I don't want to make a health food. This is the whole point. People who actually care about health are either not eating chips because, you know, they know that there are no good chips available on the market or they're going to make them themselves. Um, or yeah, they're going to make them themselves or they're just going to go without. That's what people who are already healthy are doing. Hmm. I don't need to help those people. I'm happy to like, that's great. I'm happy to make people's lives more convenient. Because, but those people represent maybe two percent of Americans, mm -hmm. if you're lucky, right? What I'm interested in is making it so the ninety-eight percent of Americans don't even have to think about what they're putting in their mouth. They don't even have to think about what they're putting in their body. Whatever they go to the store and get, they pick up off the shelf and they put in their pantry and they put in their mouth. They shouldn't have to think about anything. It should just be good, just like in the nineteen fifties, like we were talking about. You should just be able to go to the food store and buy the food and have it be edible, real, delicious things without a bunch of crap in it. So that was my target uh, in the first place. And the problem with targeting those people is that they have this impression that health is unpleasant. Almost everyone you think of, going back to what my friend was saying, who, who's like, oh, I'd rather enjoy my life than be healthy. Normal people think that health is miserable. They think they have to eat kale. They think they have mm -hmm. to eat chia seeds. They think they have to restrict calories. They think they have to give up honey and fruit and whatever. They think they have to give up meat. Normal people think health is miserable. And so if you come at them with like an expensive, healthy product, they're like, what the hell is this? I don't want this. Mm. Why would I pay more to feel miserable or like or ex experientially? Why would I pay more to like lose out on that experience? So we didn't want to market as a health product. And I still 
don't really market as a health product. Mm -hmm. I market it as like more, it's like if you had standards, if you're someone with standards, if you wear, you know, wool sweaters in the winter and you only, you wear leather shoes, you know, when you, when you go out, you, you have, you only drink out of the finest glassware and you only, you know, have wooden furniture in your home. You're someone with standards and an eye for quality. What chip would you eat? You wouldn't. Would, would you eat Doritos? Like that's disgusting. Like mm -hmm. it's demeaning. You know, it's like below you almost. It, it, you, why would you stoop to that level? Would you eat Tostitos? Of course not. You have standards, right? So what chip would you eat today or pre previous to masa? There's no answer. Now the answer is masa, and the other function of this, of course, is that by making masa into an item of uh, renown, if you will, or some some amount of prestige, whatever whatever you want to call it. It's considered desirable. It's considered, dare I say, fancy mm -hmm. or sophisticated or elegant. That is the marketing little thing that causes people to want it. And I'm not, I'm not saying the people listening to this, right? Like you guys know what seed oils are. You know what polyunsaturated fats are. You know all these things. Like mm -hmm. that's not the point. Um, the point is the people who don't know about this, what makes them want to purchase? What makes them want to buy it, right? It's the same thing. Why do people who don't even know much about cars, they're not race car drivers or anything. Why do they buy a BMW? Why do they buy a Lexus? Whatever. Um, that's what we're going after. And those brands are super successful, super widely adopted, and everyone wants them. And that is exactly what we need as an industry and a category out of a health product. We need something that people don't have to be convinced to eat because they think it's weird. Mm. We want something where they see it and they're going to be like, oh, I want those. And it just so happens to be healthy. Sneaky, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And that's my goal. And that's, you know, beyond Masa, that's that's what we're doing with other products as well. And we will we'll be doing across the grocery store is like the thing that people want because they think it's cool happens to also be the thing that is healthy for them and will make them fit and achieve their goals and whatnot. And the beauty of it is they don't even have to know about it. And that's yeah. the idea. Yeah. No, I'd love that, man. And as you were talking, I was thinking about that long term vision. It was cool to hear your tease that that's something else that you're going to continue working on, you know, as you think back to the stores, the supermarket shelves in the 40s, 50s and 60s, that the food was just far superior than it is today. And that was reflected yeah. in the health of our population. Do you yeah. do you envision that that's possible again in the future? Obviously, right now, the incentives are, are very broken, but s something has to change. And if if not you, yeah. who, right? If if not this, then what? And yeah. how do you, how, is this a hopeful vision for you? Is this a ripple effect thing? Do you think that other yeah. people will follow the path? Well, it's absolutely possible and to to return with a V, if you will. Um, and there's a few ways to think about it. One, uh, or I guess a few ways of arguing for this. One reason that the food industry will say, like to justify its actions and to explain why everything is so shitty, is that like, hey, if we didn't have pesticides, we didn't have the GMOs, we didn't have all this stuff, y'all would have starved. We would have mm -hmm. run out of food. Like we're here feeding the earth, like TM, feeding the earth, right? But little do you know, and, and whatever, that's compelling. You're like, okay, cool. So I trade off health, but I get more quantity. Okay, that kind of makes sense in my head, you know, the, the trade-offs. But little did you know that that's not true. <laughs> little did you know that the agriculture system is not designed to optimize like output of health, like output of nutrients per acre, mm -hmm. if you will. The agricultural system is designed to maximize gross profit per acre. And those two things... Uh, sorry, not gross profit, um, net income per acre to the, to the landowner. Mm -hmm. Those two things are not necessarily the same, right? If you have rows and rows of soybeans, they're all planted by a robot, the combine, you know, the tractor that drives and it, it plants them all on a nice little line. And then next two weeks later, you got to spray some pesticides. The same thing, you can fly over with a plane mm -hmm. or drive over the combine again. When it comes time to harvest, the same thing drives right over it and picks the soybeans up. And you don't have any labor, right? Like compare this to what I was saying about when we first started Moss. Even from the get-go, I needed five physical humans. Now we have like 17 people. Um, so that is very efficient economically and therefore it makes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. However, it does not produce the most amount of food possible on a given piece of land. What does produce the most food possible on a given piece of land, of course, is regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, integrated permaculture, whatever you want to call it. Um, we don't need to get into the, so all the details of that. I'm sure some pe people are already familiar with this and there are better sources capable of speaking on it than I am. But the one example of this that really convinced me of this fact that I've seen is this amazing farm in Northern Florida. I think it's 
by Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And the guy there had this valley. He had his cows like grazing in the valley. And that was great. Grass fed, whatever. But he had a problem with too much wind coming through the valley and then it would hit something. I don't know. There's too much wind in the valley. That's the problem. And so he was like, you know what? Let's break up this wind. Let me plant some trees. And so he decides to plant chestnut trees, American chestnut trees. And chestnuts, um, for those that don't know, are an actually incredible like plant source of nutrients. They're very low in PUFAs. Um, they're pretty high in carbohydrates. They're decently high in protein. They're freaking delicious. And they grow like they grow abundantly because hmm. um, they're native to the U.S. Certain chestnuts are native to the U.S. So what he did was he dotted his field, his valley with chestnut trees. And you might think, well, okay, he's planting chestnuts, but he's taking away land from the cows who are grazing. Like the diameter of a chestnut tree is like this. It's maybe like four square feet if mm -hmm. you if it's a really mature tree. And if you multiply that by 100 trees, that's 400 square feet. That's the size. That's smaller than like a one bedroom apartment full worth of, worth of chestnut surface area mm -hmm. over, you know, probably 20 acres. So basically nothing. You're not taking away any grass at all. But what do you get instead? You get metric shit tons of chestnuts <laughs> mm -hmm. fertilized by cow poop, you know, organic that you can sell to whoever. And you don't take anything away from the other productivity of the land. And that is why regenerative agriculture kicks ass. You know, if you were to plant soybeans on that one acre, then, you know, you can't plant corn there, mm -hmm. right? If you can't, if you're going to plant corn there, you can't run cows through there. But if you're going to do what we just talked about, if you're going to have your cows running through your, your, you know, valley, you can plant your chestnut trees on top of it and get it in addition. It's like multiplicative. And if you're going to then have your chickens, your pasture raised chickens running through this pasture, eating the rotten chestnuts. Mm hmm eating like the bugs that have or that are in the cow poop you know that's the, like now you get eggs and you get chickens that's like an entire two other categories of food that's super high quality that you can then sell and it's like nothing that you added onto this took away from anything else and so if you run land in that way the actual productivity per acre is mass like especially pro like productivity measured in nutrients and not like pounds of food the productivity of nutrients per acre is massively increased mm -hmm. and we, if you think about like just driving around the U.S. and think about like, okay, yeah, we have a lot of people, we make a lot of food, but think about how much land is not doing that. Yeah. Think about how many more people, even, and I'm not saying the world needs more people or less people. We're not here to discuss population or anything, but think about how many more people you could theoretically feed with higher quality food if you were to farm every acre in this way, even in the suburbs, right? Mm -hmm. You like there are some incredible urban gardens I've seen where people can grow like their entire family's year's worth of produce in a single like tenth of an acre plot of land in the outskirts of a city. You know, land is shockingly productive. Yes. However, the the only caveat here, of course, is that you require a lot of humans to attend to this whole thing. Um, but that can be fixed, certainly. So I guess to answer the initial question and to give a little bit of defense for it, Yes, obviously we can create a food system that makes food of this quality and is able to produce it in quantities large enough to feed everyone or even more people. The only question, of course, is one that aligns the resources and incentives of the people within the system mm -hmm. to actually get this done, as opposed to what we currently have, which is you know maximizing net income per acre uh, over you know large scale agriculture. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't, does that answer the question? It does. And it's really, I, th I think it's very powerful, actually, this reframe. You you hear all the time this nonsense uh, just regurgitated the regenerative agriculture isn't sustainable or scalable. And I'm like, it's literally the most sustainable, scalable thing ever. You're just saying that because it is a threat to the current systems, the systems that won't well, have such a When they monopoly. say scalable, what they mean is, um, and here's a little, here's some, I guess, business math for, for listeners. When they say scalable, what what that means in, in this context is like, can you sell more crap without having to spend more money mm. to sell more crap or without having to spend much more money? Like, does the does the amount of stuff that you're selling grow greater, grow at a rate greater than the rate at which your costs grow? And that's what they mean by scalable. And they are right in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, they are right in the sense that in order to plant, in order to harvest more acres, in this way, you need more people to do that harvesting and planting and maintenance. There are certainly efficiencies to be gained, obviously. And another cool thing, there's like technology that can actually like help with this significantly. Um, technology that doesn't actually change the food itself, but helps you farm, right? You can have 
drones that like are able, you're able to fly over your own property and see exactly what the state of your cows and wherever everything is see it all from a little aerial view with like a $300 drone. That was never possible mm-hmm. for American farmers a few hundred years ago. Another fun one, refrigeration. Like freezing and refrigeration is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's what allows us to have raw milk and not live on a dairy farm. Mm-hmm. That's And this is in part the reason why uh, it's like a, a sad accident of history that pasteurization was invented before refrigeration. Because if refrigeration had been invented first, we would have been able to produce milk out in the countryside, truck it into the city on refrigerated cars, and then mm. distribute it to the populace. And there would have never been a need to farm the cows directly in the city itself, of course, where they are not meant to be, and thereby making the milk poisonous and therefore toxic. We would never have had to need that. And we could have just had refrigerated milk the whole time. So, I mean, you know, something as you know, seemingly innocuous as refrigeration helps us a lot. Um, like the computer management of like all of your inventory and all of your, you know, all of the predictive things that can help you do to make good judgments as a farmer, nutritional soil sample testing, how easy and accessible that is. Even having little ATVs that you can drive around that are like convenient instead of having to like ride everywhere on, you know, horseback or something. Although maybe horseback is, is more efficient if you think about it. But point is, there is a lot of technology that we now have today that kind of enables regenerative agriculture, which most people think of as like old school farming. Mm-hmm. And by old school, I mean like hundreds of years old school. But you can actually use technology in a way that doesn't harm the quality of the food and allows you to produce the same amount of output with less uh, human input. Mm. That's a super refreshing take, man. I think uh, Stephen from Massa for the head of the FDA. Let's go death to Big Dorito. <laughs> Let's get Massa in there. Yeah, sir. After I retired at chairman of Ancient Crunch, I can I can go run for the FDA. That sounds good. Let's go. Amazing, brother. I appreciate everything you've shared. And I, I, I just learned um, as we jumped on this call, we were chatting beforehand a little bit um, that you're probably so used to talking about some of these things in business, but um, you're about to become a dad. And I'm curious to kind of end the conversation there. I would love sure. to hear how that is for you, you know, getting ready to become a father, what that means for the future and, and how this inspires your mission to change the future of food. You know, our kids inherit mm. this world and hopefully they're kids too and hopefully you don't fuck it up too bad so what's everything right. like you know on the precipice of becoming a dad and that kind of rite of passage and how you how you doing it how you how you raising how you planning on raising this little awesome human sure yeah wow quite a quite a heavy question honestly i've um i've said this before to like when we talk about it to my wife or her friends whoever asks like i doubt it will actually like hit me or become super relevant in my psyche until it happens mm-hmm. <laughs> not gonna lie um, which I think that is seemingly what I've heard from other fathers as well. It's yeah. like, it doesn't hit you until it hits you. Yep. So I'm just like trying to make sure that, uh, she, my wife and the baby are healthy and cared for until it inevitably happens. And I'm sure I'll have a lot of, uh, many different things to say on it. But as for actually, uh, as for actually like how we're going to raise it and stuff, I mean, she's seven months pregnant. We haven't been to any doctor yet. We don't plan to go to any doctor yet. She's fine. The baby's great. Like she's hanging out, eating a lot, Mm -hmm. like doing her, you know, having her pregnancy symptoms, you know, here and there. But all things, all in all, it's like we got pregnant super easily. The pregnancy so far has been super easy as far as, you know, from what I've heard of other people or Mm -hmm. other women, like the difficulties they face. And I can't help but think it has to do with like just, the health, right? That's what, Mm -hmm. that's what everyone talks about, right? You're, you're maximizing your body's ability to do its thing as you get healthier. And a big part of human bodies doing their thing is reproducing. And I don't think, and I'm sure if people have, if not, if people have not read Weston Price's book, Mm -hmm. Nutrition, Physical Generation, I'd highly recommend it. His study of pre-modern, pre-industrial people and like how, what they ate and how they lived and how they were healthy and whatnot. It talks about childbirth a lot and it's always in like a, it just happened, right? Yeah. There's a, there's an anecdote like that I remember, I read this book like years ago, by the way, and I still remember this. He talked about like the Alaskan woman, like the Inuit woman who was pregnant and then gave birth by going outside of her igloo at night in Alaska in the winter <laughs> by herself, Can't popping out the baby, coming back inside the igloo and not even waking up her husband who then awoke a few hours later to a newborn baby. Wow. And that was just like happened, you know, (laughs) it wasn't that crazy of a thing. So nature's job is to like 
make reproduction or just to facilitate reproduction. Like if every like that should happen. And if you allow it to do its thing, then it should just do its thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's how it's what's supposed to happen. It's not there's not any many things that we do that are more natural than doing that. Uh it's really more natural than putting on shoes and going to work under fluorescent lights all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and people don't have a problem doing that. But then all of a sudden when it comes to birth, it's like this whole big thing. Um but yeah, so I am looking forward to it and I'll uh I'll let you know once once I have the kid. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. I'm excited for you. And it just it does. It makes so much intuitive sense. And hearing your stories is exactly how we chose to go with our second son. It was completely unmedicated. We didn't have a care team. It was called a free birth, a wild pregnancy. It was oh, yeah. beautiful. It was powerful. We were healthy and you know, it, it was an amazing experience. And I think that this conversation could go on for hours about all the challenges there because maybe the rising infertility rates, well, not maybe, let's just call it what it is. It definitely has to do with the decline in health of our population, the foods that we eat and the degrade. Yeah. I mean, it's definitionally and, a health issue, right? right? Fertility is healthy and infertility is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Duh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, um, you know, we've got to have healthy options. We have to have healthy food. We have to have healthy knowledge. We have to have the information. But you said, I think a, a really key point, and, and it's it's simple, but it's profound that, yeah, you can have all the information in the world, but unless you have access to the actual options and you can kind of just have a closed loop that what I buy is healthy and, and know that there are options like Master yeah. and other companies doing great things and hopefully more and more and more. That's what we've got to get to because otherwise, right. yeah, we are living these kind of kooky lives where not everybody has six hours to meal prep every day and ferment their own sourdough. So let's get these good products out there in the supermarkets and let's try and get everybody healthy again. That's that that's nature. That's what we're supposed to be, man. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. So tell people where we can get these. Where can we go and get these delicious crunchy snacks and where they can keep sure. up with you? So you can find the chips at masschips.com, M-A-S-A-C-H-I-P-S.com. You can find me at Really Tan Man, spelled R-E-A-L-Y, Tan Man. And that's on any social media platform that you have access to. And if you're interested in, you know, childbirth, pregnancy, the whole woman side of things, you can find my wife. Her handle is the Olive Oil Queen. Oh, that's a cool name. Look at you guys with the names. Really Tan Man and the Olive Oil Queen. This baby's going to oh, yeah. have uh, quite a task coming up with a good Instagram handle after that one. And the best part is that we both came up with them independently before we started dating. Oh, that's pretty cool. It was written. Yeah. It was written in the yeah. stars or maybe in the sun yeah. or something. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, reminder to you, fam, uh, we're actually working on something pretty big here, a seed oil project. So keep your eyes peeled for that. In March, April, we'll be launching. It's obviously a big passion crossover here for Stephen and Massa and us. We're, we're taking on big seed oil. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Stephen, you're a legend, dude. Um, stay radical. Stay after it. And uh, let's go get some crunch, ancient crunch. Peace out. All right, friends, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps to spread this message of radical health. We'll see you next week.